Lego Computer Part 2. For the Sam Freedom. Hi. Last time we took a look into the logic that will power this whole computer and also explain the screen. If you haven't seen the first part, you can go watch it right here. If you would like to support the creation of this project, I have created a Patreon page. All donations will go directly to purchasing Legos for this project, and any level of support is helpful. Thank you. During the planning of this project, there was one huge problem that never went away. How was I going to make the tail mechanism? In the snake game, the tail of the snake has to be removed. Then it has to move to the new tail location. Unless the snake eats food, then it stays in place. And then it repeats the process. Figuring this out on paper is quite simple. All you have to do is store the inputted directions into a buffer and read one out each cycle. But if it eats food, then you add an entry into the buffer without removing one, increasing the amount stored in the buffer by one. Pretty simple. When it comes to building a mechanical version of this, it's not that easy, because you need to store up to 256 possible entries for a 16 by 16 screen. I have had many ideas, including a giant wheel for this, but all were either impractical, used in NXT or EV3, or were just going to be too expensive. Just a few weeks ago, though, I came up with a plan which uses few parts and meets all goals. I now present the first version of the tail memory buffer. Let's start with the most important part of the buffer, the actual memory. We can put a ball axle pin in a crank piece and then put it in the hole on a tread piece. That will allow it to be rotated on the tread. We can either leave it in a straight line or we can rotate it side to side, giving us two possible states. That is how we can use it as bits in memory. Now we can use an arm with a slope tile to push it to the side, setting a zero, or you can raise the arm up, letting it pass through and staying straight in the line, setting a 1. The bit will then move down the buffer and eventually arrive at the reader. If it is set to the side, which is a 0, it will then pass to the side of the reader and not do anything. But if it is in line, a 1, then it will push up on the reader and hold it there for the rest of the cycle. If the reader is pushed up, it will then pull on a line attached to the output. The output will then move a clutch from one gear to the other, switching the direction of rotation and enabling the output, which will go through some more logic and eventually arrive at the screen tower where it will move in that direction. The output has a rubber band to return the clutch to the off state after it is released. To eliminate the need for a multiplexer and demultiplexer, we will use four channels, one for each of the four directions. This could cause a problem of more than one direction being outputted at once, but there are sufficient ways to prevent this. To achieve four channels, we actually need two tracks of tread. And then we need a third for the setter to ride on. The setter needs to be able to move further down the line every time food is eaten, since another entry is added without one being removed. Now then, if we are going to make this perfect, we would need up to 256 possible entries in our buffer. But with this design, that would mean our track would need to be over 20 feet long and require over 120 feet of tread. I can't have this because my goal is to mount this on a 4 foot by 8 foot board. So I decided to cut the buffer down to about 100 entries. So technically the snake could only ever fill up about 40% of the screen, but I think that's more than enough for a practical game. So, then if we have two treads per bit length, three channels, a hundred entries, and two sides for the top and bottom of the track, that's going to come out to about 1,200 tread lengths needed, which turns out to be about 47 feet of tread. That's a lot. Going back to the design now, the setter needs to be controlled from any position, and here I am using a rail for each channel that is actuated by a pneumatic piston. This rail pushes down on the L-shaped part of the arm, which lifts the arm up. The belts will then move, and any arms that are still down will move the bits that pass it to the side, making them a zero. This design uses a rail that goes for the whole length of the track, but it may be cheaper and more efficient to have the pistons on the center mechanism itself. The inputs themselves are coming pretty much straight from the human controls. The resetter is rather simple. It just guides the bits to be in a straight line again. The belt stepping mechanism is an interesting assortment of moving parts. 
The master clock pushes a rod, and when that rod is at its farthest point, it then releases a stop on a belt. This will let the belt start advancing, and just a bit after it starts moving, the band pulls the stop back into place, and the three-way piece will only allow it to advance one-third of a turn. This whole mechanism will advance the belt one entry per cycle. Another of the same mechanism will be used to move the setter belt, and I just have to make a way to switch between them, probably with a clutch switched by an if-food-is-eaten output. With the parts I had on hand, I was able to make a small test of the system. And I found many problems with the design, but I was able to fix most of them rather quickly. The crank turned into a 1x3 Technic piece and a 3 quarters pin because it didn't fit in the tread very well. What's under the tread got moved around because I <laughs> admittedly didn't model the bottom side of the tread, which collided with what I did model there. The string connected to the reader and the outputs got changed to a stiff arm because it was too stretchy. I do have one unresolved problem of that the bits are too loose on the tread, but I should be able to add a more grippy surface between them. Other than that, this design is functional and has many potential improvements for the future. I'm quite happy how this turned out, considering this was my biggest worry for the project. My next challenge will be designing version 1 of what I am calling the screen towers, which are going to be what reads and writes to the screen. Remember, the screen is the RAM. This is the next hardest part of the project, followed by the reset mechanism, which will have to reset all of the machine for a new game. This is going to be a very expensive project. I estimate it will cost anywhere between five to $10,000 or more. In fact, the parts cost for the tail buffer will cost more than $400 in its current state. So if this is going to happen, I will need outside help. If you want to support the creation of this project, I have created a Patreon page. All donations will go directly to purchasing Legos for this project, and any level of support is helpful. I mean, just a dollar can buy 232 of these bad boys. Patreon benefits include your name in these videos, early access to videos, access to behind the scenes and BTS streams, and I plan to be doing a bunch of that, and even help me make decisions on the project. Thank you for watching, and uh... Oh my god, there's 11 of you now. ...of this project. Okay.